Thank you for coming, and thank you again to our hosts for this terrific event. Um, Your Excellency, you have the title of the Secretary, as the Secretary General Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy, which is a weighty title. It, it, it does sound like we're a cult, I know. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, to give even more weight to uh, your mission, uh, in fact, your in job is ensuring that Qatar's efforts to host uh, the world's most popular sporting event uh, are a success. So there's no pressure whatsoever. None whatsoever. We're, we're handling it, you know, in stride. <laughs> I'm wondering, actually, if we could start out by, um, you know, you're just, just over three years away from the World Cup, which is supposed to be, which is November 2022. Um, can you give a progress on the infrastructure projects and the state of the building and how prepared you are? Absolutely, uh, Mark. Uh, well, you know, let me, let me just break it down. As you know, what, we're, what we propose and what's been agreed is eight stadiums. So the status of our stadiums so far, uh, we've got two stadiums already commissioned. One stadium will come online by the end of this year. We've got two more stadiums that will come by, by uh, first quarter of next year. Uh, and by 2021, uh, by the end of 2021, all our stadiums will be online, tested, and commissioned. Uh, of course, there's a significant amount of infrastructure that comes along with the, with the hosting of this tournament. Uh, so in terms of the metro system, um, you know, actually as a great achievement from scratch in 2010 to today, uh, we actually have our entire metro system that we will need for the World Cup will be ready, tested, and commissioned by, I believe, the first half of, tw of next year, 2020. Expressways, all the necessary expressways that we need for the, de for the delivery of the World Cup will be ready uh, again by, I think, the first quarter of 2020 as well. Um, and in terms of uh, ICT infrastructure, that's already upgraded to the level that's actually required beyond, uh, beyond FIFA's requirements. So actually today, uh, I believe we have certain pockets in the country that provides 5G network coverage. By the time 2022 comes, a, a significant portion of the country will be covered by the 5G network as well as all the relevant ICT infrastructure that is required. Uh, training sites, we're done with all the training sites that we need, uh, that, that's required. Uh, we're talking about uh, around about uh, you know, more or less 40 training sites already. They're actually being utilized as we speak right now for the different events that we host, for the different uh, uh, tournaments that we host. Uh, so I'd like to say in terms of infrastructure and buildings, we're very much on track. Now, of course, there's a second element or a second phase that we're entering into right now, which is the operational side. Uh, operational preparedness had started early on. We were very uh, careful to ensure that we, we, we establish ourselves operationally through uh, participating in other major events, such as, for example, the Euros in, in, in France or the World Cup in Russia, uh, to gain operational experience. And we're bringing, transferring that knowledge over here into Qatar now. What we're doing is uh, establishing ourselves in terms of, you know, by the end of this year, we'll be hosting the Club World Cup. Uh, this year and next year as test events. So we're entering into that operational side of, of experience as well and, and capacity building. Um, and more importantly now, as we develop, of course, the buildings, the infrastructure, the operational readiness, the most important part that we believe is, you know, for, for hosting a major event is the legacy part. And it's something that we launched you know, in 2010. We were very uh, uh, careful and cognizant of ensuring that we deliver legacy. Today, we're reaping the, benefit, the benefits of some of our legacy programs before the event is even held. Hopefully, with the, with the intention that beyond 2022, the legacy events or the legacy projects will live beyond that as well. So we'll get to the legacy projects in a, in a little bit. I'm um, wondering, I mean, obviously you embarked on this uh, where the situation in the region was, was uh, one way as it had been for quite some time. Uh, in 2017, obviously, a great deal changed with the imposition of the blockade. I'm wondering how has the, from a practical standpoint, the blockade affected uh, how you uh, do these projects, resources, where you get your materials, uh, costs, uh, how, how big of a wrench did this throw in the entire uh, plans for getting everything on time? Well, I mean, again, I think when we're talking about, you know, the wrench, there, it's important to distinguish two elements, right? There's the, the wrench in terms of delivery of the project themselves, and then there's the wrench in terms of the overall vision for the project itself. And, and, and I'll get into these distinctions in a second. In terms of delivery, obviously, you know, from the very beginning when we first bid to host the World Cup, this was not a Qatari World Cup. It was a regional World Cup. It was the first World Cup for the Arab world and the Middle East and the Islamic world. That was always our vision. That was always our intention. 
So throughout 2010, the first day, you know, up until 2017, our intention was to be very inclusive in terms of delivery of the tournaments, not just inclusive in terms of engaging with the, with the region, you know, uh, uh, let's say rhetorically, but also ensuring that uh, you know, companies from within the region participate in delivering this World Cup. And that's why we went out to the region and we relied heavily on countries within the region. Now, obviously, when the illegal blockade was imposed, uh, we had to quickly reassess our suppliers reassess uh, uh, delivery companies. And I think maybe within the first, first month, maybe first two months, uh, it was a bit of a challenge uh, in terms of finding alternative suppliers. But I think very, very quickly, we were able to find alternative suppliers. Yes, they might have been a bit further away, for example, from Malaysia, from Turkey, uh, you know, for, for providing certain raw materials or services. But we quickly came to discover, to our surprise, that either the quality was higher, or in certain places, the cost was actually cheaper than some of the companies that were, you know, specifically, for example, from Emirates, from Dubai, from Saudi as well. So that's where you were, you were getting a lot of your materials from Saudi Arabia, from the UAE? From Saudi Arabia, from UAE, there was significant mm -hmm. portions as well. Now, but then, you know, as soon as we, all, we, we, we switched and we found alternative suppliers, uh, we were able, you know, there was obviously, a, a, you know, let's say a significant increase in cost just finding alternative suppliers, but mm -hmm. once we were able to uh, 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 lock in the contracts, put the contracts into place, these, these, the spike in pricing uh, normalized, mm -hmm. and there, was not a, there wasn't a significant increase in the budget. We were able to handle that very, very quickly. And I think it, you know, it speaks, it's a testimony to the resilience and resourcefulness, I think, not only of, of my team, but generally of the, of the nation that was able to very quickly find alternative suppliers uh, and, and absorb the costs very, very quickly. Uh, now, that's in terms of the delivery side. But obviously, again, for us, we've always said this was a regional tournament. And one of the elements of the region was for us, you know, the legacy of the tournament to extend beyond Qatar. The engagement and the participation of the success of this tournament was to, was to extend beyond our borders. And, you know, that wrench, unfortunately, still remains. Uh, you know, for us, we know for a fact from, I'll give you an example, we've launched our volunteering program uh, last November. Today we have over about over 260,000 people who have registered. Uh, to, to, in our volunteering program, and a significant portion of it, or not a significant, but a, but, a, but a significant number come from the blockading nations, showing that there are people that are still willing and still uh, desiring to engage in this tournament, and yet unfortunately, the, the obstacles that, that's imposed on them, not by us, but by their own nations, still remain. So obviously that wrench is something that, that we're hoping that, you know, for, for the sake of the people, and again, this is a tournament for the people, uh, that gets taken away. Well, a couple of months after the blockade, you gave an interview to the New York Times, and you were asked, is it possible to still have a regional tournament given the blockade? You said yes. Absolutely. You still believe that? You oh, still, absolutely. Even though now, two years later, positions have hardened, and they don't seem to have uh, a clear exit to, any, any clear exit to, to this situation. How do you do that as, as Qatar seems quite isolated, at least from its immediate neighbors? Well, again, it's important to point out, we're... we're you know, as you said, maybe isolated within uh, three countries within the immediate region. We still have, you know, th there are other nations within the region that, are, that we still have a very great relationship with and participating with us. Uh, we're not isolated within the global commu community and definitely not within the regional community. We're still a very vibrant, active participant in, it, in, in, in the regional community. Uh, in, within, for example, let's take the football world, within AFC, within FIFA, we're a very active participant. And as you can see, you know, we've hosted, for example, during the Asian, Asian Cup tournament that was in, in UAE, a lot of the nations that went to play in, in UAE actually used, their, used Qatar as their base, uh, training base, before they went to participate. So, so you know, we're definitely a very um, engage, engaged participant within, within, within the global and regional community. The reason I say we're still, you know, this is still a regional tournament, it will always, always continue being a regional tournament, is for the following reasons. First, we're still engaging with the people of the region. We're not looking at ideologies. We don't support ideologies. This is, you know, Qatar is very careful to ensure that we separate sports and politics, and that, and you know, it, it's it's in part with our vision of resolving conflict through dialogue. So, sports for us is a platform for bringing people together, and we still go, we still push that uh, narrative and 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 deliver on that narrative on the ground. Our engagement with the people of the region is is as strong as ever. And as I said, you know, using that simple example of volunteers, when we hosted our when we launched one of our stadium, uh, stadiums uh, last year in, in uh, Al Janoub Stadium, we had volunteers coming in from without the, within the region. People from every walk of life who wanted to be part of this event, who wanted to be part of the journey of delivering the World Cup. 
and they were very enthusiastic. They came on board. They, you know, volunteers who came on board gave many hours of their, of their, of, of, you know, of their, of their life dedicated to, to actually delivering a small little event, let alone participating in the delivery of the overall uh, World Cup. So the people are engaged. The people want to do this. The people want to be part of this historical event. Now, what we're doing also with our legacy projects is ensuring that we ensure that benefits remain with the people, that people actually benefit on an individualistic basis after the tournament. And, and these are you know, through launching initiatives such as Challenge 22, which talks about supporting entrepreneurs, uh, using Generation Amazing, which uses football for development, for the, engage, for the development of individuals through civic duty, communication skills, leadership skills. And I can go on and on about a lot of legacy projects that the individuals are benefiting from. And just through the engagement, you see that there is an excitement. You see that, there's, that, that there is uh, a desire to be part of this historical event, regardless of whatever obstacles ideological, autocratic governments might, might impose on them. And yet there's still a great deal of political geopolitics involved, not only in the cup, but in, in uh, Qatar's image in the region. So um, this, the, one of the, uh, the theme of this conference is misinformation, disinformation. And, and one of uh, the phenomena in the last several years is how um, different countries in the Gulf have tried to use and weaponize uh, information for image uh, to uh, go after rivals, etc. It's, it's, it happens on both sides. Uh, there was a, and pr ongoing, there is a campaign, uh, uh, information campaign uh, to sort of present the idea that Qatar isn't ready, that, that they will not be ready for the World Cup and uh, it will be a complete disaster. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the campaign uh, that you know about um, and and is it ongoing, and who's behind it? I mean, I think for us, you know, let's say the World Cup in particular, you know, what we experienced uh, when we won the right to host the World Cup was, a, it was a, a, a campaign that was waged against us very aggressively. And over the years, we always thought it was just, you know, certain sectors or certain sections of, of, of you know, uh, sore losers, uh, other interests that got in from, let's say, you know, certain uh, media entities that, that just happened to uh, find common ground and, and attack us. In 2017, when the blockade happened, things started coming out to light. And we came to discover that there were interests or there were certain parties from blockading nations that, that contributed to that disinformation previously in a clandestine way where we had many potential suspicions, but it never really came out to light. In 2017, I think everything came out to light, and we saw it. And what specifically was being done? Uh, misinf uh, well, let's let's go out and you know t t touch base on it. You know, obviously the the, the charges of corruption that was being spread out uh, uh, throughout, uh, and was being supported by uh, different uh, uh, inter different interested parties from within blockading nations to disseminate this information. Uh, there was, for example, in 2017, there was there was an event that was uh, held in in England, in London. Uh, by an organization uh, that was meant to support uh, transparency in sports. Uh, people were paid. Nobody knows who paid them. Speakers were paid. Nobody knows who paid them. There's, there's obviously uh, suspicions as to who, who paid these people. They brought on, on board speakers, uh, football uh, uh, pundits, uh, and uh, they, were, they were fed information to, you know, the event was a global event. It was supposed to talk in sports in general, but it was very targeted towards Qatar, disseminating information against us, uh, false information against us. Uh, and when they tried to bring speakers, such as, for example, a, a, a renowned human rights activist, uh, Nick McGeehan, to speak in the event, Nick McGeehan actually mentioned he'll be, he'll be criticizing not just Qatar, what they wanted to talk about when it came to worker labor rights. They wanted to talk about general topics, uh, and he wanted to address other nations as well. They immediately pulled back the invitation. And, and it led to Nick McGeehan actually doing some research and finding out that the, that the whole event was very, was very shady. For an event that was held that was supposed to be about transparency in sports, journalists that were invited to the event were not allowed to ask any questions. There was no Q&A sessions for any of the journalists that they were allowed to pose to the, to, to the speakers. Uh, there were speakers that were, that were invited that were very clearly um, pro-UAE and pro-Saudi. Uh, that, that, that that's, you know, had nothing to do with sports, and they just used that platform to attack Qatar. That's just one example of an event that was hosted uh, in, in, in England for an attempt at disseminating information or disinformation at the time against us. Uh, now, 
you can take that and, and then you know extrapolate it into the into the into the uh, cyber world, into Twitter, into people, uh, into speakers that are that are uh, that have clear ties to entities in UAE, entities in you know in other other different nations, uh, that that are you know continuously disseminating misinformation uh, against us, such as for example uh, you know. Um, uh, there was a report that came out that, that uh, from uh, a, a company called Cornerstone, a Cornerstone Global Risk. Uh, the New York Times wrote about that. The New York the, Times addressed, yeah. addressed that and, and clearly addressed the links between that organization or that entity and other people from within, within uh, blockading nations. So setting aside the misinformation and, and the campaign you described, uh, there has been uh, a lot of information that has come out from independent organizations that is certainly uh, w uh, well researched and well corroborated on particular issues. One, on the issue of labor rights. Yes. Uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch have um, issued very uh, critical reports uh, the uh, documenting the deaths of laborers in Qatar, uh, some many associated with World Cup uh, facilities. Uh, there was a recent report of uh, of uh, hundreds of Nepalese workers dying in the, in, in the last several years. Um, and uh, you don't uh, you you accept this? You said, do you accept these reports? Uh, do you accept the research that that went into the reports? And how are you addressing these problems? Let's then, let me, you know, before addressing these particular reports, just come out and say this. I think the situation on worker welfare, there, I, there's no nation in the world today that can claim that they've actually addressed all aspects of worker welfare reforms. Uh, the state of Qatar is no different. Uh, and we accept the fact that we need to do a lot of reforms in relation to worker welfare. Uh, it's something that the state has recognized before hosting the World Cup, but since hosting the World Cup, and this is one of the legacies that the World Cup has, uh, uh, has started creating, started delivering on, is with the spotlight, initiatives were accelerated. Um, uh, and work in relation to labor reforms was accelerated. Now, has enough been done? Absolutely not, and a lot more needs to be done. And we've welcomed, you know, a lot of these reports that highlighted the issues that, that, that are out there. We've welcomed these reports that have highlighted, um, you know, initiatives that we thought uh, were sufficient, but these reports highlighted, it's, it, you know, the fact that there's still more to be done. Uh, they've highlighted the deficiencies in these, in, 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 in these issues. Um, now, in relation to, to, to the reports that specifically address um, uh, the deaths, from our side, from the Supreme Committee side, you know, obviously any death, regard, it's, it's not a question of numbers, it's quite, you know, any death is a tragedy. And it's something that you know, we have to work very hard towards ensuring that it doesn't happen as much as possible. Um, from the Supreme Committee's point of view, from my organization's point of view, what we have done is uh, we've instigated now medical checkups for anybody that works within our stadiums. So over the last year, anybody that comes in and works within our stadium has to have an annual medical checkup. And throughout this checkup, we've actually been able to highlight and identify certain at-risk individuals and, and either uh, embark on a path of, of uh, re, uh, uh, addressing the, the, the ailments that they have or requir requiring that they move on to a different job so, so, you know, to, to, to reduce the risk in relation to health or you know, what, whatever other uh, uh, medical care that they need. Um, we've been able, and, and as a result of that, we've been able to really highlight a lot of different issues uh, with certain individuals that you know, they themselves didn't know before they came to, to, to the country. Uh, we've also uh, 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 implemented a TPP system, a, a, a medical system, uh, uh, that actually links up all the different stadiums today. So workers, whether they come from different companies or same companies that are potentially within the different stadiums, are able to highlight and pick up, you know, bring up their, scre uh, their medical screening tests in, 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 certain, uh, in different stadiums. And this highlights uh, or it reduces the risk of potentially uh, a company taking out a worker that has, you know, that we've identified on a certain a site which has an issue and putting him in a different site, uh, you know, for the, for the sake of using him but not, not taking into consideration uh, their health. And with that, I think we've been able to reduce the issues uh, that, that, that were highlighted in certain reports. We've actually instigated now a uh, heat stress uh, study. Uh, with the ILO, with the International Labor Organization, because part of the studies that you mentioned from Amnesty and Human Rights Watch is the issue of heat, heat stress and its contribution to uh, the deaths. Uh, we've had a study done by uh, an expert uh, and the International Labor Organization, as well as the Ministry of Labor, as well as the Supreme Committee. The findings have come out. They've identified certain mitigation uh, um, uh, factors that we have, to, uh, we have to implement on the stadiums and on work conditions, uh, and as well as implementing 
uh, an innovative uh, initiative that we've, we've undertaken within the Supreme Com Committee, which is cooling vests and cooling clothes, cooling overalls, uh, that have proven to reduce uh, the temperature, to reduce the body temperature by, I believe, um, I, I need to confirm this, don't quote me on this, but I think with, with about uh, maybe uh, six or seven degrees. Uh, that actually creates a much more safer environment as well. Are these actual uh, reforms in your mind working? Because uh, the most recent reports suggest that uh, the problems remain, and even at the World Cup sites, uh, you know, I don't know the specific, can you put a specific number of deaths associated to the oh, World Cup? Uh, in terms of work-related deaths, Unfortunately, we've had three work-related deaths. So three associated with the World Cup facilities out of the hundreds or thousands? Well, let, 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 let me clarify. Yeah. Again, again, we need to, I think, clarify one thing. Um, there, there, there are a significant number of deaths. I don't know the total number of deaths that have occurred, unfortunately, in, on, let's say, work sites, construction sites generally in mm -hmm. the country. Uh, but in relation to the World Cup, we issue, you know, every, every time, um, you know, if, if a death occurs uh, or if an injury occurs, we issue a report. The report is available on our website. It is a transparent report. We instigate uh, investigations. The investigation is supported by a trade union, BWI, Builders and Wood Workers uh, International, who come and uh, support us in these investigations uh, so, that the, so that it's a transparent uh, public investigation and the results and findings are uh, publicized on our websites and in our annual reports as well. Uh, on the on the World Cup uh, sites, we've we've had unfortunately three work-related deaths, which are and the work definition of work-related death is death occurring on the construction sites. Uh, we have had uh, I need to con it's I believe uh, from my last reading uh, 26 non-work-related deaths. Non-work-related deaths are unfortunately uh, deaths that occur outside of the training, uh, outside of the construction sites. So people that die from cardiac arrests uh, at their homes uh, or, or not while they're performing their but work. It could be associated with the work that they were doing. As well, well uh, un yeah. unfortunately, the reasons for these deaths are, 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 are unknown, and, and uh, unfortunately, autopsies have not been performed. I know that one of the uh, uh, issues that Human Rights Watch, for example, has addressed is the issue of autopsy, but the autopsy is not something within our control. It's not within the remit of the Supreme Committee. Uh, autopsies are, 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 not, are, are not performed uh, if there's, again, it's, it's, it's within different entities that are to decide whether an autopsy gets made or not, uh, gets performed or not. From our side, uh, what we've done to try to minimize the issue, or, or at least capture the issues early on is the medical checkups that we do on an annual basis. Now these medical checkups have highlighted people that have had issues with their hearts, have had issues uh, in relation to respiratory issues, had had issues in terms of blood pressure, whatever else it is. They've highlighted a lot of these issues that could potentially lead to this. And I'm, I'm proud to say that, that um, since we've instigated our medical, related uh, uh, medical checkups, the, the number of non-work-related deaths has actually decreased significantly. It's not been eliminated, but it's decreased significantly. So what I'd like to say is these initiatives do deliver. They are on the path of delivery. Are they delivering? Are they, are they sufficient enough? Um, the safe answer is to say no, but I think we still need a bit more time to, to realize the results on the ground. Uh, but the, 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 the immediate results are promising in relation to uh, it being uh, at least efficient and effective. The, uh, you know, this issue certainly going forward will be one that, uh, you know, Qatar in continues to get scrutiny for leading up to the World Cup. What is your hope that, uh, is your hope that the cup itself will lead to a broader discussion in this country about workers' rights, labor rights, and uh, worker conditions? Well, I think it's starting to. I mean, keep in mind, you know, I have to say, I'm, I'm, you know, within, within the work that the Supreme Committee has done, I'm very proud of, uh, you know, and, and again, in the wider scale in terms of Qatar, I'm very proud of, 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 of the work or the reforms that are being uh, uh, delivered uh, as a result of, let's say, the catalyst or the acceleration of the World Cup. So let's, you know, I'll, I'll specifically mention initiative that the Supreme Committee has done and then I'll move on to the more wider uh, um, aspects of the country. You know, when, when we first started with the, with the initiatives in, in relation to uh, worker welfare reforms 2010, uh, long before the scrutiny actually uh, intensified on Qatar, we instigated worker welfare forums. Now, you know, in Qatar we don't have any trade unions, and this is one of the issues that we were uh, uh, at loggerheads with, with uh, uh, trade, international trade unions. But what we wanted to do was create a safe environment where workers can raise their concerns uh, without the fear of retaliation. And we've launched worker welfare forums where workers would have representatives, they would have a free, uh, safe area where they would, as I said, raise their concerns. Over the years, these worker welfare forums had representatives that were, um, 
uh, that, that were basically named to being representatives that were uh, voted in. They actually had elections that, uh, that they were able to uh, vote and elect their own representatives. Uh, these worker welfare forms moved from uh, worker welfare forms addressing issues as mundane as just food or you know, bed, uh, bedding issues uh, to being issues about talking about minimum wage, talking about overtime payments, uh, addressing late payments, and addressing ser you know, s serious concerns. Over a period of 10 years, these worker welfare forms, ha I believe today, are genuine uh, forums to address issues of workers. And this was done over the last 10 years, you know, through the work of the Supreme Committee, as well as trade unions assisting the workers in utilizing these, uh, these forums. Uh, if we go, for example, to another issue that is a plague globally, not just within Qatar, is the issue of uh, recruitment fees. Now, recruitment fees are illegal anywhere in the world. Um, you're not, uh, unfortunately, uh, sending nations have not been able to clamp down on the situation. And Amnesty had written a report, you know, asking basically or, or, or trying to figure out a way, a solution to this issue. Within the Supreme Committee, we've been able to uh, work with our contractors over here to flip the burden of proof, because previously the burden of proof was if a worker claimed that they paid recruitment fees, they had to show a document, or they had to show some sort of proof that they paid these fees to get reimbursed. We, you know, we flipped that on its head, and the burden of proof today is on the contractor to prove that the, that the, that the employee did not pay it. Contracting companies have joined us within the Supreme Committee to um, pay and reimburse any worker that claims that they paid recruitment fees. Uh, over a period of three years, we're, we're uh, I think the number is about 100 million reals, so we're talking about maybe, th you know, give or take about 30 million, 30 million dollars over the next uh, three years will be reimbursed to about, give or take, around 20,000 workers. Uh, this is something that, that, that we've had international, co I, I believe, I'm not mistaken, and I need to confirm this claim, I think only Apple internationally has been able to address this issue more efficiently than us, globally. This is one element of, of, a, uh, of a legacy that we're, that we're working on, not just on a regional, ba on a local basis, but also on an international global basis. I, you know, again, as I said, the, the medical checkups themselves, the, the fact that we're, that, that we're introducing now, on, on a nationwide basis, um, a minimum wage, uh, you know, which was not there before, now minimum wage uh, 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 on, on a general basis uh, is, is, is being introduced into the country. Um, the system of the kafala system, which was, in, which was pr provided previously, is, is being changed right now. Yeah, how is that? Is that, that do, you, do you think that over time that will change? Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I think, I think the concept of, you know, I think the labor market in Qatar is being reformed. Mm -hmm. And it's being reformed today to an extent that we are, uh, you know, I think maybe with the exception of Oman, we are being leaders in the region. At least in terms of, you know, the, the, the amount of work that's being done within the period of time. We're, we're definitely being leaders in the region. And that's why you see you know, other countries today uh, that, that are following our initiatives. The World Cup is leaving a legacy in relation to that. It's leaving a legacy, and, a, and it, one, it's creating a debate within, within, within the society over here. Two, it's creating actual reforms on the ground. Three, it's leaving a legacy uh, on the ground. But it's important to, find, to, to highlight one point. A lot of the criticism that we receive is that it's not being done fast enough. And I want to address that. If you want to create a change in the labor market which has legal, social, economic implications, and you want these changes to last beyond 2022 or actually be permanent changes, it will take time. You cannot change it overnight because as soon as you change it overnight, it can just as easily snap back. And that is why some of these changes are taking a bit longer than people might, might, might hope for. But we're doing it out of our own commitment and conviction that we want these changes to be permanent and last. And you can see the impact happening. Now, of course, is enough being done? Nowhere close to it. There's a lot more to be done, not just in Qatar. I think globally, no nation can today come out and claim that they've done enough in terms of labor reforms. And as a matter of fact, you see countries, you know, some, international, uh, some, some countries uh, internationally are actually even uh, clawing back some of these reforms. It's an ongoing process, uh, but we are working very hard to ensure that the safety, security, and more importantly, the dignity of everybody without exception, working in the state of Qatar is protected and maintained. I just have a couple minutes left. I want to get to the, uh, just a couple more of the geopolitical issues. Uh, the, uh, who knows whether the blockade will still be in place in 2022. Um, is, though, the fact that Qatar is hosting these games, get, does it give 
the country a degree of leverage in this situation, perhaps. The, the closer it comes to 2022, uh, the prospect of the blockading countries not being able to fully reap the benefits, might that give leverage to Qatar in resolving the dispute? I think the, the, the direction of the leadership and the direction of, of, of uh, us as a host nation is very clear. We're not using this as leverage. We're using this as, as a platform and a catalyst for positive change. Uh, and, a positive, and a catalyst and, uh, for positive change that the people may benefit from. That is, that is our goal. Uh, and, and for this to extend beyond, obviously, the borders of the state of Qatar. So we're not using it as a political pawn. We're not using it as a political leverage in any shape or form. Now, the issue of whether the, 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 the blockading nations uh, you know, want to reap the benefits out of this tournament and take off you know, whatever barriers that they've imposed is something that's within their decision. Um, it's, so it's very, very clear. The borders into the state of Qatar are not closed. Everybody's welcome. It's as simple as that. We've not imposed any restrictions on anybody to come or go in any way, shape, or form. And that's why we're confident during the World Cup, again, our borders will be open for everybody to come and participate and engage and, and reap the benefits of this tournament. Uh, and that's why, as I said, it's not in any, you know, we're not using it as a leverage. What is the biggest threat to the, game, to the World Cup, uh, the success of the World Cup? And I, when I... When I We'll ask more specifically, what are the, what are the most spe specific threats you're worried about uh, to the World Cup? I worry about everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, no, I mean, literally, I worry about everything. It's, uh, I think I'm being paid to worry about everything. I mean, obviously, there, there's, there's a lot of issues uh, uh, that we need, to, we need to be careful about. Uh, you know, it goes without saying, any major event, any major international sporting event will always have a high security, uh, uh, security uh, uh, risk. And that's why what we've done is we've established a security committee over seven, eight years ago uh, with all the relevant security apparatuses, uh, participants in that committee, chaired by the Prime Minister, who is also the Minister of Interior. Uh, we've got uh, relationships with all the different, well, major security agencies, whether it's Interpol uh, or um, national security agencies, uh, to reap the benefits and experiences uh, from them. I think, obviously, you know, you always have... Uh, because we deliver a unique tournament, which is a compact World Cup, which is not such as, for example, Russia or Brazil, you know, in vast nations, so fans are spread out within the nation. Spans, fans here will be concentrated within uh, a compact um, area. Uh, obviously, there's always the risk of, of um, uh, let's say, fan, you know, belligerent fans um, causing issues. That's obviously... Soccer, is football fans belligerent? Football, well, they, listen, football fans aren't belligerent anymore, but every once really? in a while they come out to yeah. be. And they do come out to be every once in a while. We hear about them. But, I mean, obviously that's, a, that, that's something that we have to factor in. You know, you, you can't, you'd be blind not to factor that in. You know, fans uh, or tensions rising between the fans. And that's all what we do, you know, what we're doing is we're, we're engaging very closely with security uh, agencies from, from within all the different nations that will be participating in the tournament uh, so that we try to, you know, not heavy-handedly police them, but gra gradually... Uh, have the fans themselves, you know, police themselves, support themselves in terms of uh, ensuring that, you know, things don't get out of, uh, out of hand. But that is obviously an issue that we have to keep in mind. Uh, in terms of the delivery of, let's say, I, I have no concerns about the delivery of the infrastructure and all that work. I think, you know, we're, 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 we've gone beyond the critical point. I'm very comfortable with that. It's the operational side of things today. Uh, to make sure that everything gets delivered uh, in the right way, uh, gets delivered efficiently and, and effectively. And you're going to continue having these concerns up until the end of the tournament. This is nothing, uh, this is nothing uh, foreign to anybody that has hosted these events. The one aspect for me that's always going to be a heavy burden for, me, for us and me personally is in 2025 and 2026, you know, trying to, trying to you know, or hoping to see the benefits of this tournament. The benefits of this tournament in terms of individuals. Being able to point out at individuals, at families, at companies, at enterprises, at organizations that can come and say, as a result of the World Cup, this is where we are today. This is where I am today. These are the people that are being employed within my company because of this World Cup. This is the contribution to the region's development. This is the contribution to the region's stability. And God knows our region today, I think the globe, needs stabilizing uh, events. The region especially needs stabilizing events, events that somehow can serve as a beacon that people can, can gravitate towards, can move towards, towards enhancing and enriching their lives. We have enough issues that separate us, 
I think we need to today focus on, on uh, the platforms that unite us and bring us together. And that's one of the aims that we've got for this world. So that's how you're defining success, not just that you have a month of games no, no, go no. off without a hitch, there's a winner, the month uh, there's of games, no disaster. For right? me, you know, I think anybody who's seen Qatar over the last 20 years knows that we host major events at a very high rate of success. So I don't have much of a concern over there. We'll be able to do it. We'll be able to do something that people will be happy about. The real measure of success is beyond it. You know, have we been able to really contribute to the, to the region? Have we been able to contribute to the individuals within the region? As I said, has, can people turn around and say, because of you, we're here today? And, and today, you know, today we have some great stories, individual stories, you know, sporadically separated of, of people that have benefited out of, our, uh, out, of our, uh, out of this World Cup today, you know, three years ahead of the tournament. But the real measure of success is four years, five years after the tournament, the benefits are still being reaped. Your Excellency, uh, good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you.